I'll take you to Stanford Research Institute. Oh, we spare nobody on this. Stanford, Stanford Research is back in the, uh, the 70s, 72 or 73 or so. This is a, where did I get it? This came from the little apartment that I'm living in right now. Okay. Uh, stainless steel Malway or something, or Malos or Malay, maybe. I, I can't quite read it. Uh, this is a stainless steel, uh, what we might call a dessert spoon. And I'm going to ask this gentleman sitting right in the end here, would you hold on to each end of the spoon like that between your fingers for me, please? Oh, you're very good at this. You ever done this before? What? Natural for show business. Hold it. Hold that. Keep it on here. Not so natural after all if you drop it. I'm going to stroke it very gently. Stanford Research Institute back in 1972 heard about a young man named Uri Geller, an ex-fashion model from Israel, who said that he could use his mind power to bend steel. Does he look getting warm at all? No? No. Oh. You have no imagination whatsoever. Hmm. I'm just going to, to, to shake it very gently. Hold it firmly now, OK? Just going to do this with it. Do you see it sort of shaking, like, like, like getting flexible? Isn't that a strange? Now hold it just for the very, very tips. Of it. That's it. Very, very gently. You see how it seems to get sort of floppy and wobbly? Oh, it seems to get let go of it now. Thank you. I'll just hold up. Uh, I'll hold it right up here where everybody can, can see. This is difficult because uh, the audience is a little dark. I'm just going to wobble it back and forth. The illusion you get is that it's turned actually rubbery instead of elastic. It almost looks as if it's made out of limp plastic or something like that. And it's actually stainless steel. It says right there, stainless steel. Shakes back and forth. It gets more and more flexible. The illusion is so strong, he would swear that it's really bending. Now, some people even tell me that the bowl of the spoon bends over that way. If that were to happen, I would have to give away the million dollars, of course, because that would be a genuine miracle of a semi-religious nature. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> Would you hold your hands out for me, please, uh, uh, like this, so that you can catch it? It, huh, it fell into two pieces. I don't know how that happened, and I don't care. <laughs> so there. I think the spoon deserves a big round of applause, don't you think so? <laughs> now, folks. Uh, with this trick here, remember what I did? I took the envelope and I went in behind the little screen here. It's quite possible that in walking in there, what I might have done is switch it in my coat or at the back of the, of the chart here for one that I already knew the contents of. That's possible, but that's not the solution. How can we prove that it's not? Would you be kind enough to show us very clearly the other three cards that you have on the floor underneath? You see, you let them sit with this solution, which is all wrong, for quite some time until they find out that that solution is not the correct solution. Folks, scientists are very, very good at what they do. But I know some scientists that can't iron a shirt I know other ones that can't boil water. That doesn't make them less scientists. Or if someone that I know, a personal friend, makes excellent brownies but can't work calculus at all, that's no detraction from that person because that's not that person's specialty. We all have our specialties. Scientists are particularly crippled in one way. They tend to look upon things in view of their own specialty and only their own specialty. I'll give you an example of that, a very good example of it, I think. Many years ago, I worked at the New York Coliseum on an electronic show where different manufacturers had different booths. And the International Resistance Corporation, IRC at that time, had a booth that looked about like a phone booth with a glass front on it. And every 20 minutes, the curtain would go up at the front. And they would see, picture this now, like a telephone booth like this, with a floor at about waist level, and people would stand in front of it and look at this wonderful demo. There was a tube, stainless steel tube like this, sticking right out of the top of this telephone booth sort of thing. Went right down through the floor of this, this booth. There was a hole in the side of it. Sticking out of the hole of the side of it was a hand that was in a silver lame glove. The curtain at the front would go up, and a tape recording would start saying, Good afternoon. 
This is International Resistance Corporation. I know because I did the tape, you see. And the hand would start to move. And the hand would suddenly reach right out of the pipe. Here's a pipe like this. Nothing behind it, you can see all the way around it. Just suddenly reach out of the pipe and pick up one of the items on display inside, show it to the people, and lay it down again, then go back inside. And then it would turn around and meh. Then the pipe would go down, it would pick up another one, come back up again, show it, stick it out, boom, put it back. I'm doing this very simply because that's my arm that we're seeing there, a disembodied arm. Of course, I was uh, on the other side of this. I could hear clearly what people would say outside. And there were very highly trained scientists and technicians out there. And one pair of gentlemen stopped right in front of the booth. I had a way of peeking out, you see. He said, uh, standing there with a the, the big clipboard saying, there must be at least 40, 40 servo mechanisms in there. And they each said there'd be a multi-channel, yeah, probably multi-channel tape. And they have to use at least one inch tape for that. And that could, they probably have several different programs too because I've noticed the movement isn't always the same. Very complicated. And this must have cost them a fortune to make. <laughs> Next time the curtain went down, then came up again. I noticed the same two gentlemen are sitting there. And the hand stood there like this. Good afternoon. This is International Resistance Corporation. Suddenly the arm shot out and went on the glass like that, right in front of them. They turned and looked. <laughs> went right back in and started to handle the goods. The one fellow looked at the other and said, they must have many different programs. <laughs> if they had been optical engineers, they wouldn't have had to think in terms of mechanics. They would have come by and they would have said, uh, Oh, two 45-degree mirrors, very interesting. <laughs> That's all it was, was two 45-degree mirrors like this, and I was standing in behind, peeking through the one-way mirror and doing this sort of thing and picking up the articles and whatnot, and they thought they could see around it. But the mechanical engineers thought only in terms of mechanics and servo motors and multiple track tapes and such. That's the only way they could think. That was their specialty. And that's the direction in which they thought. Scientists are a strange bunch. But they're human beings, just like everyone else. And they have the same weaknesses and the same needs. And because of that, I have seen, in many cases, scientists bite off much more than they can chew when they're handling a problem they think they can solve. I'm going to give you an example of that.